Hey, so good afternoon. Once again, welcome everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you here today where we're, we plan to spend the next hour looking at how we can reimagine an optimal education system. This afternoon, we're going to be taking a look at both the theory and practice of the model presented in the new book, Making Schools Work, Bringing the Science of Learning to Joyful Classroom Practice. My name is Emily, and on behalf of Teachers College Press, the publisher of Making Schools Work, thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to spending the next hour together. Making Schools Work is not an ordinary book about reimagining edu education. It is a theory, a plan, an implementation strategy, and a series of case studies. It was written collaboratively by a group of classroom teachers, administrators, parents, and learning scientists, led by longtime collaborators, Kathy Hirsch-Pasek and Roberta Golenkoff. We're very grateful to have them here with us today. First, Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, who is a professor of psychology at Temple University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and Roberta Golenkoff, who is the Unidel H. Rodney Sharp Professor of Education at the University of Delaware. They are joined by three of their co-authors on the book, Kimberly Nesbitt, who is an Associate Professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at the University of New Hampshire, Carol Lautenbach, who is a retired Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning Design in the Godfrey Lee Public Schools of Wyoming, Michigan, and Elias Blinkoff, who is a graduate student in developmental psychology at Temple University. We're looking forward to a really dynamic conversation with this group, so just a little housekeeping before I hand it over to them. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be sent to all registrants within a few business days, so look out for that and please share it with colleagues who may not have been able to join us this afternoon. There is a discount available on the book exclusively through Teachers College Press, so please look to the chat panel for, discount, for details on how to redeem that discount. Uh, we will be reserving some time at the end for questions, so please ask them using the Zoom chat panel. And at the very end, we'll be doing a giveaway of the book to one lucky attendee. So make sure you stick around to the end for a chance to win. We're also pleased to announce that there will be a follow-up to this webinar, the how-to of making schools work, which will get really into the nitty gritty of doing this work with teachers. So please look out for more information about that. Finally, if you enjoy this webinar, please make sure to tell your colleagues and visit tcpress.com to sign up for Teachers College Press's mailing list. We strive to publish the resources that matter most to teachers and teacher educators. So please stay in touch and check out what we've got coming next. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Kathy. Thank you so much. Well, I'm Kathy Hirschpasek and I'm Roberta Golenkoff. And we are super psyched to have you all here today. And first, I just want to say welcome to the team. Uh, for long enough, we kind of felt like teachers were being handcuffed and they took the joy out of the classroom. So and you know what happened? No. Teachers were leaving in droves. Oh, no. Yes. Well, making schools work yes. is about joyful teaching and deeper learning. Next slide. So making schools work is what happens when teachers, school administrators, and scientists work together to give you practical, evidence-based pedagogy. It's what happens when teachers who are tired and working hard, begin to reignite their love of teaching without having to change any of your curricular goals or your lesson plans. Now, students, as a result of these changes, rediscover the joy of deeper learning. It's wonderful. <laughs> but we shouldn't be telling you this. We should let the teachers speak From for themselves. Their own mouths. That's right. Kay. There you go. Yep. Active play has transformed the way that I teach to have someone come into your space, join the stream of your learning and be with you in the process and then guide you through reflecting about that learning and that exploring to hone instruction and hone that choice time experience was invaluable. I cannot say enough good things about the experience. Since incorporating active playful learning, I have noticed that the children are engaged more in the activities that the teachers provide for them. We just growing together, trying to get different brainstorming, different activities and ideas together and collaborate and just create a beautiful life masterpiece. I think this model is really and really in a great way having teachers rethink what teaching really is. I think we can solve a lot of things or support a lot of things by 
just supporting children and helping children grow in so many different ways. And I, I see play-based as really the perfect vehicle for that. Well, thanks to our teachers. And lest you wonder, we actually use this approach in our college classrooms as well. So it goes all the way from pre-K all the way up to college. So today is going to be a kind of four-part talk. First, we want to talk about some of the issues facing education that you guys know all too well. And then we want to talk about our approach to joyful teaching and deeper learning. It's a three-part equation, as you just saw, that can be used in any classroom. But then we thought you should see it for yourself. And so from Michigan, Carol Lautenbach is going to come in and tell you what happened in Michigan schools. And Kim Nesbitt's going to tell you what's happening in New Hampshire, along with Elias Blinkoff. Then we open it up for your questions. The issues. As Yuval Noah Harari wrote in 2021, the Industrial Revolution has bequeathed us the production line theory of education. It's easy to laugh at this model, and almost everybody agrees that no matter its past achievements, it's now bankrupt. And Harari wrote this in thinking about what the year 2050 has in store for mankind, but we're not going to let it rest there. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now, another way to think about this, especially in a time when AI can write like Shakespeare, can compose music like Mozart, is that we got to really worry about what happened. I think November was a watershed moment for all of us. But if we had those creators in our classroom right now, they probably would be practicing on drills for the state exams rather than showing their immense creativity. If Mozart, this says, I don't know if anybody could read this. If Mozart and Michelangelo were students in today's American schools, here comes the teacher running in. Wolfgang, Mike, stop wasting time. You should be doing practice drills for the state exams. So in this age of ChatGPT, and of course in, in November, it was just ChatGPT. Now we're up to four and five and beyond. I think it's time to teach skills that students need for tomorrow, not for yesteryear. So today, we're going to share with you our solution to joyful teaching and deeper learning and the three-part equation that we can use everywhere. Let's teach. This is very dramatic, guys. This is why scientists started working with teachers, so that together we could look at how we might, get ready, teach in the way that human brains learn. What a novel idea. It's a very novel it's idea. It's amazing. I know. We've, We've never done it. I mean, a lot of years of doing yes, the science. Let's right. use it. Next slide, please. So this is a new approach because it's a science of what we know and all the knowledge that we have accumulated over 50 years of research. We're going to emphasize what are the principles of learning that we can pull from the literature, they're out there and we can share them. Well, I must say, I think it's the first time that you're going to find all scientists agreeing on what those principles might be. Next slide, please. So here they are, the defining characteristics of how children learn. Get ready. We emphasize that children have to be active, not passive. For adults, you could throw a phone book at them, but mm -hmm. kids really have to be active and working hard. Yeah, and I think that means they have mm -hmm. to be have agency. They have to take some control of their own learning. What about engaging? Engaging and not distracting. So we have seen apps in the world that take children off the storyline with advertisements. We don't want this and we don't want this in the classroom either. It should also be <clears throat> meaningful. Sorry. Our kids come to school with a fund of knowledge. 
They come to us with a cultural background. We can draw on that and make it richer for them, richer for us, and make what they learn meaningful. As opposed to being totally disconnected from their lives. Mm. It also has to be social. Now, not everything has to be learned with a group, but children learn better when they work with other children and adults. The research is quite clear. They learn best when it's iterative. That is not just the same thing over and over again, but the same message couched in slightly different ways. That way, when they learn it, they can actually transfer it to something new. And it needs to be joyful. Oh, no, no, no. I know, I no, know. It no, sounds no. bad when used with education because so many people think learning has to be boring. Not hmm. so. Now, it can still have a learning goal, right? It should have a and learning a goal. And a learning goal. It should. And it absolutely. can match the curriculum, but we can transfer our lesson plans to say, am I active enough? Is it engaging enough? Meaningful, social, iterative, joyful? Next slide, please. So we achieved this through what we call guided play. And there are two definitions. One is a plan play environment, which is what many, many teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, are doing now, enriched with objects and toys that provide experiential learning opportunities for kids. Think the way museums, children's museums are constructed or Montessori classrooms. And if it's well designed, the kids can <laughs> actually discover. They become explorers in your lesson plan. And they come out knowing exactly what you want them to know. Now, adults can also enhance the children's exploration and learning by asking what we call open-ended questions. Questions that don't have just one right answer, like, like what, what color, color is that? that? <laughs> and suggesting new ways to explore materials. Next slide, please. Active playful learning can be thought of as a two by two grid. So if you look at who initiates it, when the child initiates it and the child directs it, it's what's called free play. That's like a fort in the living room, right? Yes. And that's also got what it. got us into trouble when we were kids. Yeah. When it's initiated by the child, but the adult takes over, right. notice the helicopters. We call that co-opted play. Mm -hmm. And when it's initiated by the adult, but the adult listens to the child in terms of what the child wants to learn. Then on the top right hand quadrant, we have guided play. Yes. Finally. And wait, I just want to say the adult still sets the agenda. Absolutely. It's not that the child sets Absolutely. the agenda, but the kid explores within that. Yes. It's direct instruction. What are we doing most of the time? Well, this is what our schools look like now. The adult has the goal and the adult directs the learning. And most of the kids, as in the picture, sit and listen. Mm. This is not the way mm. to do it. Not active, playful learning. No. Next slide, please. You can also think of it as a spectrum. I'll do it real quickly for you so we can move on. Initiated by a child, directed by a child with an explicit learning goal. If there's no explicit goal and it's child, child, it's free play. But notice games and guided play, they're initiated by the adult, but they're directed by the child. And that's where the power comes in. Next slide, please. There's a huge body of evidence. Sorry to make you crazy with this picture. Uh, that suggests that the pedagogical approach that we endorse and many, many other scientists endorse uh, helps children master academic, social skills, and much more. So kind of what we're showing you really has a basis in science. Is that right? Unbelievable. Absolutely. Next slide, please. So what we've developed is what we call the three-part equation. So here we go, guys. This is the secret recipe that you need to apply to every classroom and to what you're doing. One, be respectful of cultural values. That's what makes it meaningful to kids. Like I can teach math when I do basket weaving. I can teach math when I do knitting. But what are the cultural values that matter? Second, the science of how children learn that we just showed you. And three, in the AI world, we also need to understand what children need to learn. They need to be. They need to learn how to communicate, to collaborate. Of course, they still need content. They need to develop their critical thinking. They need to have creative innovation because 
AI is going to do it all. So we need to work with our children on developing the skills that computers cannot readily do. Finally, they need to have confidence. They need to learn from their failures as opposed to thinking of them as terrible. So in confidence, we include what Angela Duckworth calls grit and what Carol Dweck talks about as growth mindset. But notice they're all interconnected. To communicate, you have to collaborate with someone. When you have content, it comes from communication and collaboration. It builds all the way up. Next slide, please. Let's start with community values. Quickly, what we do is we talk to people. We talk to members of the community. To Seriously, you, you I take know. the community's point of view and consideration? I'm telling you, we also talk with teachers and we say, what's important to you? Next slide, please. Here's one way we get at that. We ask, what do we want to create? What are the values that we care about in our classroom? How do we want to make people who are a certain group of people feel very welcome and included? What characteristics do we have in our classroom? How do we make sure people feel welcome? And whatever we're doing, how do we respect the community that we and our students come from? Next slide, please. Who fills that out, Kathy? Oh, well, we do it in discussion. Oh, with All members right. of the community. And I think we went over this one already. This yes. is the how of learning. And this is what we call playful learning. And this is what we call the six C's or the what of learning. So let's move on and let's see it at work. And let's pop it right now to Carol, who's going to, oh, tell us, I'm sorry, I think I have two more slides as we look at how it works. APL in the classroom. I just want to say, that a lot of ministries of education are currently adopting this. This first piece, the purpose of the program is to establish a strong foundation for learning in the early years, play-based environment, Ontario Ministry of Education. Singapore is adopting this kind of that method. That is surprising. It's, it's really it incredible. Is. To achieve our mission, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Education will provide our children with a balanced and well-rounded education, develop them to their full potential, and nurture them into lifelong learners and good citizens, conscious of their responsibilities to family, community, and country. Next slide. In suburban Philadelphia, just quickly, when we use this, a relatively affluent school district, median household income of $62,000. The district kindergarten teachers were going to full day kindergarten. They said, can we use the six C's? We said, sure. Of course. What did they find? They found greater percentages of kindergarten and first grade students demonstrating grade level math and reading skills. And which, which I find remarkable, a decline in special education occupational therapy referrals by first grade because kids got to move around, got to talk to each other, and got to have hands-on materials. So it kind of worked. Next slide, please. Kind of worked. Example two in Western Michigan, you're going to see a lot more about this when Carol comes in and shows you what it looks like. The teachers were thrilled. Small community district, 78% Hispanic Latino, 95% free lunch. Well, thematic instruction rooted in active, playful learning in the six C's gave benefits for the students and teachers that they reported across the entire district. And I would like to say what a teacher said as data collected by Elias Blinkoff. I think that the six C's have given them, the students, more ways to express their thinking, but also it's helped me understand that there's more than one way to assess someone's learning. And obviously I knew that before, but it's really opened up my mind more. Next slide, please. And finally, in New Hampshire, and, and you'll, you'll hear a lot that. more about this from Kim and Elias, Again, 31 kindergarten classrooms, six-month embedded coaching program to enhance active play, uh, guided play. And they got significant gains in comfort, practicality, the importance of play-based learning. And we got an increase in the six Cs. Next slide, please. Here you see collaboration went up, talking went up. They were asking more questions in the classroom, more use of manipulatives, and more involvement more joyful learning, but they're also learning more. Next slide, please. We're now expanding, thanks to the Lego Foundation, into four states, California, Illinois, Virginia, and Texas. 
We're going to be in a lot of schools, 25 schools, three teachers per grade, 90 experimental teachers from K to second grade, and then we're going to move on to fourth grade. So here we go. We're out to see how this works across the country, but we're feeling pretty confident. And now you're about to find out why. Next slide, please. Skip along, please. Skip along. Okay. So now, Carol, Carol I think you're on. Okay. Yes. Great. I will take it from here. Thanks for that great overview and introduction. We're going to go a little bit deeper into some of the things that we heard uh, at the beginning uh, about the district that I spent my career in, uh, Godfrey Lee Public Schools, very community-based, uh, lots of diversity in the district. And uh, certainly we found that the, the results we were getting were not what we knew we could get. So we had to shift our practice. And you're going to hear about uh, shifts in practice toward supporting the six C's, uh, toward really strengthening our tier one instruction. Uh, we couldn't uh, really remediate our way out of a weak tier one. Tier one is where the magic happens. Uh, and you'll hear about uh, some of the things teachers did for that. And then also identifying and supporting student need. So we can go to the next slide. So all along, you've been hearing about community. And on the whiteboards there, you see a community um, uh, event that we had where we really brainstormed together with our community what an ideal classroom looks, looks like and what are the characteristics of an ideal uh, graduate. And uh, this involved uh, people from all stakeholder groups. And from that, you can go to the next slide, we decided to do home visits. Now, home visits are nothing new, but the purpose of our home visits were a little bit different, I think, than traditionally. Really, all we wanted to do was connect with our family stories. You'll see one of our, uh, our parents there and the quotation that, that she said, uh, how uh, honored she was to have people from the district come and listen, and listen to what mattered to her and to her family and to her students. Next slide. So um, after doing that with uh, 19 families, representative families in the district, we put all that data, all those stories together. And what we determined was parents really wanted to make sure that learning had meaning to their students. You heard that before in the earlier part of this presentation. They wanted learning that was connected to their students' lives and interests. You heard a little bit about that at the beginning. And they also wanted school to be a place where their own opinions and value, uh, values were, uh, were contributions they could make to the district. So the district got, got to work transforming, really looking at uh, the six C's as the framework that we would work in. And what you see on the screen here is what our uh, first grade team did. Uh, I think there were six teachers involved in this. They took the framework that you saw before, with the four levels and the six C's. And they took an experience uh, called the farmer's market, uh, a thematic, uh, year long thematic focus that they did with all of the first graders. And what they did was sit down together and say, so if a student is collaborating at a two level, a side by side level, what would that look like specifically in this unit? So you can, uh, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but this, this, uh, this slide is such a uh, wonderful example of what happens when teachers have agency, when values of the community are reflected in the curriculum, and when play, full of playful things, uh, really drive the lesson planning that's happening. So you can move on to the next one. Another thing that we did was partner with our cultural institutions in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is very close to Wyoming, Michigan, where God freely is. And this is an example of uh, what students in uh, fourth grade did uh, uh, to develop their literacy skills. And all of this happened, and I won't take the time to, uh, to read through this narrative, it's wonderful, but um, 
what they did was learn at the museum first, experience some of the artwork in the museum, and then use that to create a new animal and give it characteristics and uh, then write a story about it all as uh, part of their literacy um, learning. So next one. So Grand Rapids Public Museum also has a program called Immerse, and this is just an amazing program because the uh, the teachers who uh, whose students uh, go to this program meet with museum staff and choose which standards in the in the curriculum they want to focus on while the students are there. And the students actually spend a full week right at the museum, um, learning within this uh, this really rich environment. Uh, one of the things they do, I love the quotation from the student too, you know, we learned, we learned things. I didn't even know I was curious about them until the student was exposed to them. And I will say, I think one of the, um, the greatest things, you can leave it on the slide, that's fine. Um, there is an exhibition of the learning that students do. And parents, of course, are invited to that. And remember, we have, uh, we have a large immigrant population. And I was at one of these events and a parent uh, came to me and we had a translator there, thankfully. And the parent said, I didn't even know people like me could come here. I'm bringing my family back. So that experience that the child had uh, in one of our cultural institutions opened up a whole new world uh, to, to the family as well. So this is a quotation from a Godfrey Lee educator. Uh, again, just, uh, focusing on the six C's in a playful way, being able to collaborate and communicate with something that interests them, and then let let them allow uh, uh, allow them to take the lead leads to authentic learning and uh, joyful learning uh, for both student and staff. All right, next one. So unfinished teaching and learning, some, some folks call it learning loss. I, I really prefer uh, this term, unfinished teaching and learning. Um, this approach helps support all six C's, a thematic approach that's playful. Again, developing tier one content, so that first encounter with the information that's important for students to know. We have to make that as strong as possible. Um, we do that through coaching, through uh, strong leadership of teachers and collaboration. And then identifying student need. I think we all know that uh, there are many, many needs in our communities. And an approach like, like this can help uh, with mental and physical needs, as we heard before. Uh, we can align social emotional learning with this and certainly collaboration and communication with family. So we're all working together for the, the benefit of the students. Next one. So uh, before I pass this off to Kim, I'd like like you to think for a minute just about your own school experience. So what do you what do you remember? How often did you experience learning that lasts? If you did, what was it that made it memorable? And how has it helped you thrive in your career and family? And next slide. So the bottom line is we need to slow down the teaching to speed up the learning and follow uh, the child's lead. So thank you for the opportunity to tell you about Godfrey Lee. I'll pass it on to Kim now so you can hear about New Hampshire. Thank you very much, Carol. So I'm delighted to talk about an experience that we've had in New Hampshire over the past four years to try to bring playful learning to our state. And I think there was a great question in the chat about ages. And is this something that's more for the younger grades? And I'm going to give examples that were really situated within the context we were working, which really are applicable more mostly to the elementary and um, primary grades, because, you know, that's the area where we were uh, afforded, we were afforded the opportunity to work with those teachers. But I wanna say that the concepts of finding ways to make learning more collaborative is something that no matter what grade you are in is going to be important. The ways to make sure that you are supporting active and age, active, active participation and agency in your students is going to be vital no matter what grade you're in. So the examples I'm going to provide really are leaning towards the elementary grades, but I hope that you can see in their glimmers of how 
these constructs can be applied in maybe a slightly different circumstance to really be applicable to our upper uh, grades, because the term project based learning is going to be very synonymous what we're talking about with playful learning. So I hope that even if this isn't the thank you, I could take a breath. I love that. Um, is a way that you can think about how you can supplement this in your own unique context. So please take this as an example. But I think that those questions are great because we're going to have another how to session. And I think we could really bring in and show you how this can be expanded across the whole uh, the whole grade span. All right. So let me just share a little bit about what happened in New Hampshire. So what we did as a state is there was a playful learning mandate put into place actually as a legislative mandate. And if you want to learn more about that, you can it's all outlined in the book how that came about. But when we get work together with our Department of Education, it became how do we want to approach this as a state? So it's the idea that all our teachers are supposed to be doing all of our, in particular, our kindergarten teachers are supposed to be doing playful learning. What does that mean? So we really latched onto that concept of guided play because our teachers are like, we still have learning goals. Students have to learn certain things in order to be able to be ready to go to first grade. And we want to make sure they're learning them. So we really latched onto that idea of that, yes, we can still set explicit learning goals for kids, but yet we can apply an approach that allows kids to have the agency that we want them to have, because that's how they learn best, to be able to collaborate with each other, to engage in the learning in ways that are appropriate, to be able to make it meaningful for them, so something that they care about. We want it to be iterative. We want them to think about how they pull in existing knowledge and integrate it with new knowledge. And mostly we also wanna make sure that it's joyful. And so there's lots of ways in which you can take this principle of guided play. So there is a explicit learning goal set by the teacher, but it's, initi or it's uh, initiated by the teacher, but children have agency in saying where that activity goes. So we think that this can be embedded in any aspect, regardless if you're in the elementary grades or you're teaching you know, 12th grade biology. This is something that can be an approach that you integrate. And so what we think about here is deep experimentation. And these experimentations can last days, they can last weeks, or in some cases they last months. And so you can integrate these principles into like a targeted one-time activity. So I'm doing a math lesson on one-to-one -one correspondence, well, I could either give the kids a worksheet or I could give them the opportunity to make collections and count various numbers of items in their collections. A very simple thing, I'm taking it away from the worksheet and giving children agency to drive where that activity goes. They can be more in-depth explorations and experimentations. So we're gonna do an inquiry into erosion and how when the snow melts in the mountains, it erodes the, you know, it trickles down to the rivers the rivers overflow and cause erosion. So we could talk about some sort of experimentation around a more targeted topic. We can engage in project-based learning experiences. My favorite teacher of ever was my third grade teacher, Miss Naki, who had us create our own business in third grade where we took out a loan from the bank to make uh, treats that we sold at school. I don't think you can do that anymore. And then we had to repay the loan. And then with our profits, we brought acreage of the rainforest because we were also doing a whole study on endangered species, right? So this idea that there's a big project that expands multiple months where we're all building over this iteration. And another thing you can do is a lot of our pacing guides have thematic or topic units. So in ours, you might be learning about things like the seasons. You could be learning about community helpers. So these things can be very um, thematic or topical that we that expand over multiple months. So you might think of ways in which you integrate it into that. And that last point is really what we did in New Hampshire mostly. And we did this in a, in a framework that maybe looks very familiar to you because we do this all the time in literacy and we do this all the time in math. It's the workshop model. So where kids would come in with an adult, oh, I'm gonna, yeah. So we use this model because what we did is allocated about an hour and a half of the day, our schools allowed teachers to dedicate time for a deep topical exploration of a concept that this classroom was learning about. And so we gave them this, this workshop model, gave students and teachers the time needed to go through this process of exploration reflection in order to construct knowledge. 
and this extended time allowed children to take charge and have agency over their own learning. And this was an agreement with our teachers and our schools to really utilize this approach because this is what we thought was most effective. It is one type of way to do this. I'm just wanting to provide this as an example. And so the workshop model we picked is because it allowed us or you as a teacher to effectively facilitate and be a documenter. So somebody asked about assessment and how does that play a role? Our teachers really leaned into when we give children agency and they did this through small groups or centers, the teacher was allowed to be a facilitator walking around and taking notes and jotting information down so that they could authentically in the moment capture what children's understanding was. And so what did this look like? Well, in this time block, and again, at most it was a hundred, it was an hour and a half. It usually was somewhere around 45 minutes. But about 15% of that block was just kind of preparation. You might consider this a mini lesson. The teacher sits down with the kids and says, what is going to be the goal of our workshops? And these workshops were small groups or center-based kind of experiences for kids. So they inform students the goals of their learning. So learning goals are explicit to the kids. They know what they're trying to learn. And they can include that kind of relevant background information, maybe some vocabulary or some concepts we want to integrate. And then the majority of our workshop was this time for extended guided play, where the students had an agency to dig deep. And so what we did this again is through this idea of student directed centers and studios. And I'm going to give you an example of that on the next slide. But we also know reflection is, is important. So after each time children did guided play, the teacher would bring the students back together and the kids would have time to share out about their learning and reflect on their learning. So these are just 10 minute blocks at the beginning and end. Uh, the preparation was about 10 minutes and the post reflection was about 10 minutes. So we chose to leverage centers and studios in our classroom. And so what we did is we know that the teachers every day used an array of centers and studios. And what they were able to do is because I have these studios that are reoccurring in the classroom, they just kind of switched out the content focus. What is it explicitly you're going to do in the writing and language arts studio in order to reinforce that concept? So the studio settings never really changed. It was just what they were focusing on. So some of the studios our teachers would have in their classroom are a writing and language arts studio, a creative arts and design studio. They would have a science and discovery studio was very common. Math and manipulatives was a very common studio that was reoccurring. Uh, there would be a blocks and construction period of time for our studio for kids to choose from. And then we also had some dramatic play and role enactment happening in these classrooms. And the idea here is that what teachers would normally do and pick as a topic is something that crossed content area. It was an idea or a concept, but I could pull in math. I can make this more about science. I can pull in the literacy piece of writing, but it was a way that you could take a topic and think about it in a more dynamic way. So let me give an example of what this could look like in your classroom. So we, we can say our school is doing a five-week exploration of animals and habitats. In particular, my classroom is going to learn about pollination and the importance of pollination. And so what I might have done as a teacher is I select a bunch of really great books out there. You can find books about anything. And so we would read books about pollination and read books about uh, bees. That's providing us our basic content. But what we were hoping to do is through the guided play, they would apply that knowledge in those centers. They're taking what they're learning from the books and the discussions and whole groups and applying it in their own unique ways because they have agency. So students would read books, all kinds of things about different bees. And so as a teacher and our coaches went in and worked with teachers, we would have a teacher that had these set studios. So what they would have done is over a week long period or even two weeks, depending on how in-depth kids went with their explorations, you would use these same studios with the same kind of prompts or inquiries that we would have kids do. And so during this time block, kids could choose to go to the writing and language arts center. So maybe they're writing a letter to their school board in order to advocate putting a beehive in at the school. And the younger grades, this might be drawings and pictures and simple words. In older grades, these could be very eloquent, persuasive arguments to the value of preserving bees by particular putting in a hive at our school. We might have our Center of Creative Arts and Design, where we would have the students design and draw locate the location of the school's beehive. Where would we put it? How far do we need to be away from the playground? How much square footage do we need? Do they need to have pollination plants nearby? Do we need to make sure that our neighbors aren't spraying pesticides? 
that could kill the beast. So they could create their design here. They're creating their blueprint. In the Science Discovery and Collection Center, what they might do is have a collection of different flowers that they collected from around the school and look at the different parts of it. So they could be doing a labeling activity where they're taking apart and figuring out where's the pistol and the steam, uh, semen and semen, that wasn't the right word, uh, but uh, the pollen. And so really thinking about it as more of a kind of a deeper dive into a smaller component of that activity. In math, we might have them design their own bee box uh, and think about making out a schematic for that where they actually have to put in the measurements and figure out what is the square footage if you're in a third grade classroom or what's the parameter or how many bees might actually fit in that box. If I know one bee takes up so much space, how many bees can I put in my box? So you could do all kinds of small manipulations on math in order to expand that activity. We could do blocks and construction. Blocks and materials that are physical three-dimensional materials are a great exercise for cognitive development. So we could not only just draw our boxes, but we can reconstruct those boxes using things like loose parts or blocks or whatever we have in our, our classroom to make a 3D representation or model of our box, block, our B box. Or, you know, we could actually make one to scale, right? So there's a lot of different ways in which we can use three dimension and represent that. And then lastly, we might in our dramatic player role enactment center, have kids enact the role of what it means to be a beekeeper. What is the process I would go through to collect the honey and why would I collect the honey? And maybe I'll go to the farmer's market in Carol's example and sell my honey, right? So we think about ways in which they can apply that knowledge. So this can be really applied at any topic or any grade level. I've given you some examples, but I've seen this done in activities where kids are counting and making collection as being the goal. We've had it be where they're learning about presidents and historical figures. Who has not done in a classroom where you do, uh, where kids learn about a biography and then act as the wax figurine that comes to life to talk about their, their character's autobiography. That's a great example of embodying active uh, playful learning. Roller coasters and amusement parks, like that is nothing is more exciting to a kid than a roller coaster in an amusement park. So you can learn all about the physics, where they're located, where's the tallest roller coaster, which one has the most loops, which amusement park in the world has the most roller coasters. So it should have been where I grew up, which was Sandusky, Ohio, but they were recently overtaken in California. Oh, well. So you can do this with any time. And I know we're running short on time, but I do wanna just say, I'm gonna make a challenge to you and the audience to, to demonstrate how you can do this in your classroom. So in the chat, can somebody be kind enough to provide a topic your students are learning about? Any topic of any interest that they're learning at. And then I'm gonna challenge our, our panel here to provide you with ideas in which we can personify these concepts of active agency, engagement, meaningful, social, interactive, iterative, and joyful. In other ways, how can we make it playful learning? Okay, Amy, I appreciate you so much. So we've got weather. We're going to start that. Oh, I could do lights and shadows and symbolic relationships. Okay, I'm going to start with weather, but come back for our next uh, webinar and we can take all these lists and we can spur on inspiration with them. So keep putting your ideas in the box, but I'm going to stick with weather for the first one. So I'm going to go back to our different types of centers that we could have. And let's see, do I want to open it up to Kathy and Roberta, Elias and Carol to start, or do you want me to jump in, guys? Well, you look like you have a plan, so I'm going to let you go through that plan, and then I'll tell you how weather was really done in the school we were in in Pennsylvania. Oh, excellent. So with weather, if I had a writing and language arts activity, this is a great time. Like you could talk about if it, you're talking about the relationship between weather and seasons, you could have kids talk about the things that they wear in different seasons, or they can write a persuasive essay about what is their favorite weather. Do you like the sunshine in the beach, you know, because you get to go to the beach? Do you like the rain because it allows you to stay inside and, and make, you know, and drink hot chocolate? Like you could have a persuasive kind of really meaningful discussion of what the weather means for kids. That would be one idea I have. Elias or Carol, do you have an idea for another one? So uh, an idea I had was um, to uh, have uh, students take one of the narratives they're writing and uh, write one version with one kind of weather in it using some of the vocabulary that uh, they've been learning and then rewrite the story using a different kind of weather. So uh, see how the story changes and really practice using that 
uh, content-based vocabulary. And then building on that, you may even think about to make it meaningful how weather might change by by place or over time. You know, if if students were able to ask family members from different states what the weather was like that day, then they could in active activity. Um, collect all of those data from, from their family members and bring it back to the class and report on it the next day. Nice. What so. a great map activity. You could actually like graph that out, what the weather was like in different areas. And so, in terms, oh, can, go ahead, can Kathy. I, can, I jump, can I jump in for just yeah. a minute and tell you what it looked like? And then I really want to open it up to questions. Yes, please do. Okay. So uh, if you had walked into this classroom where they actually chose weather, which was kind of amazing, I had one group that was over on the left and I saw a little kid and she had a big box, like a cardboard box. And she's going like this. And I'm wondering what the heck is she doing? And there's a kid standing in front of a map of the United States. So I went over and I said, what's going on here? And the kid looked at me. The kid was, I think, six or seven, said, we're doing the weather report and we're filming it now. And I went, oh, and as I watched, the girl who was standing in front of the map told me that there was a high pressure system and she was expecting precipitation as she talked about it going across the map. And what grade was it? I think that was kindergarten. Okay. And then I walked over to the next group and they had cotton all over the place and they were building clouds. And some of them were building cumulus and some were building cumulus, nimbus, serious clouds. And, and I said, well, what's the difference other than what you're doing here? And they told me what could hold rain and what couldn't. But then I walked to the next group of five children and they had circles that were placed right in front of them and a little dropper. And each pair had the dropper and they dropped how many drops of water did it take to fill the entire area of the circle. And then they graphed it and they compared their notes. What I think I was seeing, geez, was that vocabulary of low pressure precipitation? And it's like and it to me. It's unbelievable, right? And yep. I'm thinking, yep. what grade is this? These are really weather people. So you can actually mm -hmm. see it. But what are the questions? Do you guys have that? Well, we, I see a good one here. Um, weather settings in a narrative, how the story changes. Absolutely perfect, Carol. Let's ask questions from you guys and we'll try to answer them. We just wanted to show you, it doesn't matter what topic you have to teach. We can show you that it can be more inclusive, more fun, and you'll cover everything you need to cover in your curriculum. That was that was so great and inspiring. Thank you, everyone. Um, we've got so much going on in the chat, and I'm really excited to open it up. Um, I thought maybe we would go back to one of the earliest questions we received from Karen, uh, which I think is a great place to start. Karen asks, why do teachers move away from these ideas that you're talking about, which, by the way, are so important? As a professor, I know that we teach many of the ideas that you're discussing, but students do not always use what they've learned in the college classroom, but instead they do what colleagues are doing, even if it's not in not appropriate. What impact does testing have on teachers feeling as though they have autonomy in applying these Maybe. concepts? You got it. You got it. Well, Carol, I mean, you're in the schools, you're an administrator. Why don't you take this one? Yeah, so that's uh, that's the question of the, the decade, right? Um, I, I can tell you from my experience what, what I saw, why teachers got away from this. Um, Remediation became the solution to any learning difficulties. And uh, the more you fragment a child's learning with you know, lots of different people they're interacting with and lots of different uh, personalities, uh, the less likely they're going to actually retain uh, what, what it is they're you know, supposed to focus on. So um, that I'll take time. And we found that the time for actual learning was actually shrinking. I know a lot of people are adding minutes uh, to literacy blocks, but it's not always in really high quality uh, experiences uh, that teachers uh, plan for students. So um, that's one issue, I think, time. Um, the other is that reading and math have been uh, siloed and compartmentalized, uh, we're really advocating for a much more holistic way of learning uh, through themes or through connected learning so that the same vocabulary, the same ideas 
come up over and over again in a child's experience so that they can create meaning from them. Certainly standardized testing has uh, uh, worked, <laughs> worked against, us, against us in both of those ways uh, because it's very narrowly focused and it also takes up time. So um, those are not insurmountable things though. Uh, there was a question about the change process, such a, such a wise question. I can't remember who, who uh, answered it or, or who asked it, Penny, I think. I think it's on my screen here. Um, and that is something that's really critical is to bring people along and to be supportive and to provide time for them to learn in new ways. Kim mentioned uh, uh, reflection, uh, reflecting together um, with your colleagues who are doing the same change as you're, you're doing and look at results, see what's working, uh, just goes a long way to getting buy-in. So I also, oh, go ahead, Roberta. I, I was just going to say, I think uh, much of our training of teachers is teacher as individual. And I would love to see teachers working together. Can you imagine? I mean, we just had so much fun generating things about the weather. <laughs> if teachers decide that they want this approach, they get to socialize amongst themselves and generate fantastic ideas together. And I just wanted to, to mention something because there's a great question in the chat about, oh my gosh, what would it mean to give up control? And I just want to say, you're not giving up control. Um, you know, it's funny, there's, there's control and there's structure. And we tend to think that when we give a little more control to the kids and they have more agency, that we're less structured, but we're not. We can be every bit as structured and have a beautiful lesson plan, but we've done it in a way that the kids get to play around and explore. And I will say, as a scientist, Roberta, how long we've been playing? Oh, I mean, okay, don't admit, don't ask, don't ask. But we've been playing for a really long time. And it's how we learn. We learn by playing in the sandbox that we call the science of learning. Right. Um, we've got some more questions in the chat. Um, some of these we, uh, you all handled a little bit uh, as the presentation was going on. But just in case somebody uh, in the audience missed them, I'd really like to touch on them again. So there's been a few questions about uh, teachers, like how can this play-based learning concept apply to teacher professional development and deal with teacher turnover, burnout, things like that. There were also some questions about what kind of supports um, exist for teachers who wanna take on this kind of work. Um, can you all talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I wanna throw, throw one, if I may, to Elias, who was teaching in the Philadelphia school system. Um, Elias, if you can keep it short, can you answer this one? Go ahead. Yep. So, so I would say um, it's it's a it's a about a, ba a balance between structure and agency, um, and making sure that while there's some initial guidance and a framework in place, um, the students can then can then rise to the occasion and and meet the learning goal that's established. So as I was trying in, in the comment, it, there's an opening framework, then there's the activity, and then it wraps up and with the reflection. Thank you. And, and I think um, we have a great question about preventing teacher burnout. You know, Ooh. teaching just somehow, like I used to love teaching little people, and then I felt like burnout myself, you know? And yes, everybody's telling us in New Hampshire and Michigan, everywhere we go, they're saying, thank you. Now we know why we went into the profession. Mm -hmm. Teachers need autonomy and they need agency and they need to be respected. And at the present time, there are too many schools where teachers are told they have to be on page nine on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. So this returns those good qualities to teachers, why they went into the profession. And Kim, you've been right in there with all the teachers give it a whirl and try to express if you even can what you're hearing across New Hampshire. Yeah, I actually wanna lay into a comment. I, that's not, again, not the word I was really like, lean into a comment uh, from Karen about the science of reading and how that relates to the science of learning and really thinking about the literacy piece. And this is one that I find to be really refreshing and I've been hearing from our teachers about, right? So they've been getting this downward pressure of, We've got to teach phonics. Where's your Hegarty? We need to teach phonological awareness. Where's your, you know, foundations? Like we, and 
those are two curriculums. Uh, and we honor that and we still allow that to happen. We know children are still going to, our teachers know that there's still going to be moments in the day where we are going to be doing whole group instruction. We're going to be doing these activities, but they embrace that we can take these concepts and kids are practicing comprehension. Well, they can do that in something that's personally, me personally meaningful and that we can extend to this kind of more cross-disciplinary inquiry. So I can have children demonstrate comprehension of a text because they're reading the book about the bees and they're able to then demonstrate to me when they make their beehive, they considered things like that a hive needs a queen bee or that you can a traditional hive of X amount of size can produce X amount of honey or things like that. So I can test out comprehension because I'm having them give me information about a book they're reading. We can also have them show me that they can decode and they can do phonological awareness and they can do the phonics. So I think that there was some empowerment and understanding that this is not to supplant anything you're already doing in your classroom. No. Do your math instruction, right. use that curriculum, do your literacy instruction, use that curriculum that your teachers and your district is doing. But this can be a way to add on and supplement that learning so that they aren't just getting some understanding and a superficial understanding, but getting deep deep content expertise. So this is where they got to learn that. Yes, and, and Kim, um, while you're saying that, and while people are asking these terrific questions, I'm thinking, this is why we need our second webinar where we get to talk about the how-to. Because the how-to is not mysterious and alien. It's exactly what many teachers are already mm. doing. It's uh, just helping them get insights into how their own behavior can feed into this kind of a program so they'll stay in teaching longer if they want to. And That's, building on that point for further, Kim, uh, it really is a process of adaptation and reflection, both for the teachers and for the students. So at the same time as the teachers are considering what have I done previously? What has worked well for me and my students um, and, 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 and building moving forward? There's also the opportunity for that same active learning to be happening uh, for, for all of the students. So, so it's active learning for all stakeholders in the classroom. It's professional development and growth for the teachers and the students alike. Great. So I, I realize we're kind of running out of time here, aren't we? Because we have so much to tell you and so little time. But we did want to end by sharing that so many wonderful people have joined us uh, kind of on this mission. Carol Dweck said, it's a book we've been waiting for. Making Schools Work transports the science of how children learn directly into classroom practice. Accessible, culturally flexible, and impactful book reimagines education for our time. Angela Duckworth, the six C's are both common sense and utterly revolutionary. This authoritative guide not only synthesizes the modern science of learning and motivation, but shows how it can be put into practice now. So I hope you'll bring all of your questions to the next webinar yes. where we actually show you how we do it. And it really can be done in any classroom, anywhere. And any level. And can be totally inclusive. So be on the team, be ambassadors with us. We're pretty convinced that you're going to find more joyful teaching and deeper learning. I couldn't agree more, Kath. Well, what a, what a wonderful note to end on. Um, just our very last piece of housekeeping, I have to announce the winner of our giveaway, uh, mm -hmm. which is Ennery Lopez. So congratulations, Ennery. We will be uh, contacting you to get your, uh, your shipping info. And everyone, please look out for info about that second webinar because we clearly have a lot more to dig into here. So thank you all so much for your time this afternoon and uh, you'll be hearing from us soon. Bye-bye.